On today's Maker Mashup, we're reviewing the Lattice ET4 3D printer. So today we're going to be reviewing the ET4 printer by Lattice. They sent this along and sent us some filament. We're going to try these little reels of filament here. Uh, they're 250 gram reels. And we're, this printer here looks very much like the ANET ET4. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and do a review on this and take a look at it today. Uh, we're going to try some test prints, and I'm going to go ahead and give you my evaluation in a few different categories. Now, the way that I'm going to be doing the reviews today are a little bit different than maybe you've seen some of the other 3D printer reviews out there. The uh, way I'm going to approach this is we're going to go ahead and review various areas, and we're going to give ratings in each one of those different areas of the 3D printer. And then at the end, we'll have an overall summary, but you'll be able to see how this printer best suits suits your needs, depending on which category that is most important to you. So with all that said, let's get to work. Opening the box here, we can see that they've got plenty of foam protecting the printer for any shipping, and the instructions are right here on top. There really doesn't look like a lot of parts to install here. We've got a belt, a little bit of PLA filament here, it looks like silk kind. And then we've also got ourselves our USB card reader, a couple of tools, and just a few screws. Everything on the 3D printer appears to be in major parts and sections. We've got the top half here, and then we've also got our carriage assembly right here. And then finally the base of the 3D printer. And then in this little package inside, we have the power cord and also the spool holder. Looking at the manual here, we can see that it is in multiple languages, which is nice. And then also you can see that they've got some pretty detailed instructions for assembly and also the operation of the printer. Starting with the base here, it looks pretty straightforward. We're just gonna remove our packing material here. And then they have these small plastic green strips that are on the inside to really keep the carriage, the Y carriage from moving back and forth. First part of the assembly is installing the Z-axis or the upright part of the printer. So I used this orientation and found it much easier than the instruction version, which had this on its side. It worked really well tilting it this way and then just using a little bit of gravity made this a one person job for getting the top on. Once we had this all set up, the next step here was to just go ahead and install the carriage by just sliding it onto the X axis. Once the carriage is on, then it's just a matter of taking the belt here and feeding it through the extrusion and the X axis to the other side. Now we just need to plug in all the leads from the carriage. Each one of them is clearly marked and the place where you need to plug them in on the back of the carriage is clearly marked as well. This only takes a couple of minutes. Last but not least is the spool holder, just a couple of M4 screws with some T-nuts and the spool holder is installed. Okay, so let's talk about assembly. Under 20 minutes for the entire assembly. Now a novice might take a little bit longer, let's say a whole hour, but given that, I have to give assembly a 10. This was really one of the simplest 3D printers I've ever assembled. All right, so we're gonna power this up here and you see the splash screen with Labis on it. And there's some pretty minimal options here. So we're gonna to go to print, there's a print menu. Uh, we're gonna to go to prepare here. We can see we can preheat, change the filament and level the bed. Uh, going back to the main menu here under settings, you can have manual control to move the printer, a little info screen with the hardware version and the ability to do an upgrade. Overall, there's really not a status screen on here. The menu functionality is pretty limited, but overall, this printer feels pretty solid. All of the construction is in steel and aluminum, and it is really solid. Moving it around and picking it up, it was a very solid printer. Taking a quick look at the back of the printer, we see the filament runout sensor, and we also have 
a traditional standard extruder on there. Nothing special there. The back of the 3D printer also has a pretty solid cable going to the heat bed. My one concern with this large cable in the back is that it does pop up over that extrusion and green plate there and ends up rubbing, as you can see here, on the uh, limit switch. Now that could create a problem over time where it's either causing that uh, wire to wear out or just overall uh, causing wear and tear on the heat bed cable. I think it's a pretty easy fix though. We could either 3D print something for that or we can go ahead and use a zip tie to make that manage a little bit better. The printer also comes with an auto bed leveling feature and just following the directions to adjust the screw on here uh, was a pretty straightforward and simple process. I was able to get it to level the bed here pretty quickly and then we went ahead and started up our first print. So we're printing the Rocket G-Code here that was on the SD card. This printer probably has A4988 drivers. It is not silent, so you can definitely hear it when it's printing. And the bed adhesion was really good here considering there's no brim on this print. Now it does look like they sliced this with Simplify 3D. So we're going to go ahead and also try Cura on this as well. So overall, this is a good first print. Looking at this, you can see a little bit of onion skidding there, but that's due to the type of drivers using those A4988s or the DRV drivers. Uh, the odd thing I saw was that uh, the print had a little bit of black filament in the nozzle already, probably from their testing. Uh, it flushed right out and we're using their blue filament that they supplied. So this looks really nice a good first print and it's stuck to the bed well. There's a little warping, but overall I'm surprised it stuck to the bed as easily as it did. And it removed from the bed pretty easily as well, uh, given that it was just one piece of filament that was holding everything on. And that little string at the top is pretty normal for an end of a print like this. So I sliced up a Benchy and printed that on the printer as well. And you can see here that there is a little bit of banding from the Z-axis. That's pretty typical for these type of printers that only drive the lead screw from one side. Uh, the lead screw will sometimes go ahead and bind up slightly. Um, and it can also be from the steps of the stepper. That's an eight millimeter lead screw that's on there. So the resolution isn't as good, but overall, I'm quite happy with this print. You can see again that onion skin in there from the drivers. But overall, I would be pretty happy with this as my first 3D printer. These are pretty good results out of that. So we've tested two of their filaments and I wanna go ahead and test this now against some better filament that I've got here. So I printed another Benchy here. The one on the left is in the Layer Fuse Pro PLA. And then on the right is the PLA Plus that they included. Uh, both filaments seem to perform well. Uh, the one on the left seemed to do a little bit better on the bridging, but overall they both have a little bit of stringing due to configuration of the uh, 3D printer. And overall you get that little bit of Z banding and onion skin on both prints. So clearly the filament is not the performing factor here. Both of them look pretty good. Now there was one concern that I had with the build plate and the adhesion. When you look at the bottom of this print, you'll see here that there's white on it. And that is from pulling up the uh, text that was on the build plate. So when you look at the build plate, you'll see there, uh, there's uh, words that are on it and that just pulled right up with the print. So a little disappointed with that. I would have expected it to uh, just go ahead and uh, come off the plate. Uh, they do include a glass plate as well, so if you just want to use plain glass, that wouldn't happen at all. The last test print was a base mode. Now, base mode works really well for identifying problems with the way that the printer travels. Uh, you can see here it actually did a really good job. A uh, little bit of Z-banding, but overall, except for the onion skin uh, caused by the drivers, this really did print very well. Uh, there's nice solid lines, they're very consistent. Um, and you can really, really see the detail here. This was printed at point two, but uh, I think it performed very well for this class of printer. Now I also tested the filament runout feature by just simply clipping the filament while it was printing. 
and I was a bit surprised. Now this print is being printed over USB, so I wanted to make sure that USB worked as well as SD card. So I was printing this over the USB, and what you'll see here is that the filament comes right out and the filament detector does not stop the print. Now I did only run into this problem while it was hooked to USB. When I used the SD card, it worked fine and prompted me for uh, filament replacement, but when printing it under USB, it did not actually stop the print. So here I'm testing the power loss recovery. We're just gonna go ahead and unplug the cable from the printer and then when we plug it back in, you'll see it does pop up and ask if we want to resume printing. Now this functionality only works if you're using the USB. However, when I press yes and I tell it to resume, watch closely at the top where the Bowden tube goes into uh, the print head there. Now you'll see it actually retracts and there it goes, retracts the filament about 20 centimeters back into the Bowden tube. Now the problem here is it never feeds it back to the print head. So right now it's not actually printing anything. So there's clearly a problem in the way that their firmware is recovering from power loss. Hopefully that's just something they can fix in a firmware update. All right, so let's take a quick look under the hood. We can see here that we've got an STM32 processor, which is an ARM processor and a 32-bit processor. So the nice thing about that is it is a higher speed uh, processor. However, what we also have are soldered and surface mount uh, drivers on this board. So there's no chance of upgrading any of the drivers on this, so you're stuck with it. Um, it's all a lot of proprietary cabling here as well. I don't see really anything here that would allow you to easily upgrade this printer. Uh, that proprietary mainboard and cabling is going to mean that even if you do want to rewire this, uh, you're going to have to literally rewire every connection. Now there's plenty of space in here, so we certainly could throw a different motherboard in there, but with all the proprietary cables, I don't think that's going to work out for any sort of mainboard upgrade. Using Pronterface, a quick check of M115 shows that we're not using Marlin or RepRap firmware. I also tried the M503, and of course I saw no configuration settings there as well. So for the most part, this looks completely proprietary firmware. All right, so now let's talk about the features and quality. So the good, I think it's good solid construction. It felt very sturdy and everything felt very, very solid. Out of the box, bed leveling worked really well. I was able to level the bed on the first try and then it turned out great first print. I think that first print really looked good uh, given the very first print and it stuck to the bed with no problem. And also there's some easy assembly to this printer. So all features and quality that work really good for this printer. The bad, however, was that that back cable rubs up against the limit switch. The power loss recovery feature did not feed the filament back in and the filament runout sensor only worked on the SD card and couple that with some noisy steppers. And I think features and quality overall at best is a seven. All right, let's talk first print. First, we did get a successful print on the first try, so that's a big win there. And then also the print quality looked really, really well. It didn't have any problems except for a little bit of warping. So for our very first print on our first try, we gotta give this a nine. All right, let's talk about the overall print quality. Overall, I think the print quality was good but it's not great. We clearly saw banding issues that were caused by the Z-axis. We also have onion skin due to the drivers that it has. So I think those are all dings against the print quality. They do produce good prints. So for a very first printer for someone, I think they're acceptable, but they're not great. So overall, I think the print quality is really about a six. All right, let's talk about our upgradability. Overall, I don't think there's an upgrade path for this printer. It's very proprietary. We've got the cable on the side that is completely proprietary and the main board is proprietary. There's absolutely no way to access the firmware that I could tell to go ahead and adjust settings for steps per millimeter. So you can't even put a geared extruder. So I think your upgrade path is limited to perhaps a different type of hot end on it. But at that point, you have to question why you're even putting the effort into it because there is no real upgrade path on this. So upgradability, I think that gets a one. 
I classify 3D printers into three different categories. The first class is really your toy 3D printer. Now this is going to be a 3D printer that's more novelty than function. The second category is going to be your tool category. Now this is going to be an off-the-shelf printer. You buy it, you use it, and you're going to use it like a power drill. You're certainly not going to make any modifications to it. The last category is really the Tinkerer class. Now this is a printer that you can easily upgrade and go ahead and make modifications to. And I really think the Labis falls into the tool category. There's really not going to be a lot of upgrades to this printer, but it is a really good tool if you want to just create some functional prints. All right, so now for our overall rating. The first thing we have to do is realize that this is a tool printer and it's not something that you're gonna upgrade. So for the most part, we can drop the upgrade ability off of the rating here because you won't wanna upgrade this printer. So that gives us an overall rating of an eight for the Labis ET4. So overall, I like this printer as a entry-level 3D printer. Now, there were some quirks with it that we talked about, and I think most of those are really just uh, me being an advanced 3D printer user and not having the tools at my disposal that I would normally have. But I think for someone that is looking for a brand new 3D printer, looking to get into 3D printing, this printer really does fit that mold and it's really easy to set up. As a matter of fact, this was probably the fastest 3D printer uh, build I've ever done. It really only took about 15, 20 minutes to get this up and running to the point that it was actually printing. Now, if you're someone like myself, who's a bit more of a tinkerer, when you look at this printer, there are a lot of lacking features like Baby Step and a whole bunch of other capabilities that is in native Marlin firmware that isn't in this firmware. So uh, someone that's looking to use this in a more advanced way are definitely going to feel that they have their hands tied in working with this printer. So overall, I have to say, I like the printer as a good entry-level printer. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble with it at first, but overall, I was able to use Cura, slice files, and really the SD card was a really great way to get files to it. Uh, I was also able to hook it up to Cura directly, which means it should work with Octoprint as well without any problem at all. So with that, it's gonna bring the end of today's video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you mash that like button and don't forget to share and subscribe so you don't miss one of our upcoming videos. If you'd like to help support the channel, considering checking out our Patreon page where our patrons receive early access to a lot of exclusive content. So with that, I wanna say thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time.